Welcome back to another stream. So today, we're going to be taking a look at Mega Man X2, X3, Multicarts, um, and how to build them. So right here we have a Rockman X2 cartridge. Um, that's generally the most affordable way to do this due to the fact that, um, well, frankly, uh, <laughs> Mega Man X2 and X3 cartridges are ridiculously expensive, and Rockman X2 and X3 cartridges are not really worth that much. Um, you usually can pick these up on eBay from Japan for like $20. So, with that being said, um, this is a perfect donor. Here's the thing. Rockman X2 and X3 have uh, used a special board with a special chip. It's called the CX4 chip, which is what makes the... Uh, English translations, reproductions, multi-carts, you name it. That's what makes it so difficult. I'll show you what this uh, cartridge board looks like. So, there it is. So, right here you have two mask ROMs that contain the game code for the Mega Man X2 uh, cartridge. The X3 cartridge is a little bit different and only has one mask ROM. So, it's a little bit simpler, but... Um, and then this right here is the CX4 chip. This is a custom chip developed by Capcom specifically for Mega Man X2, and then it was used on X3 as well. Those are the only two games that ever use the CX4 chip, and basically all it what was really there for is um, to provide wireframe 3D support. There were some fancy effects used in X2 and X3 that had like wireframe, uh, like real-time wireframes rendered on screen for Sigma. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much what it was for. Uh, I would say maybe a little unnecessary given the fact that it was just used for a few effects, but uh, regardless, it's required in order to do a multi-cart um, or a translation or uh, even ROM hacks or anything like that. So th this this guide could be, this video could be used as like reference for doing ROM hacks, um, you know, just simple translation you know, installations or multi-carts as we're doing today. So, let's get this out of the way. Let's talk about adapters. There's a few things to say here about adapters. This right here um, will look familiar if you saw the, um, the video that we did on building a Star Fox 2 cartridge uh, from a Stunt Race FX cartridge a little while ago. This is a retro stage Super FX adapter, and it's from uh, the website Retro Stage, uh, RetroStage.net. Uh, they sell these for about three, I think it's like three dollars for uh, for the board. And um, basically, this adapter is meant for doing Super FX chip, uh, like custom ROMs, uh, Star Fox Two cartridges, all that sort of stuff. And basically it adapts a 29F032 or, or 16 or 33 or any other pin compatible um, flash chip to the SOP package that these cartridges use. Um, so it just goes right there where the mask ROM used to be. And this is what it, we're going to be using for doing CX4 cartridges as well. Uh, the issue is that this isn't really meant for use with the CX4 cartridge. Uh, it wasn't designed for that. Um, so in order to make this work for the CX4, you actually have to do modifications to the board. And I'll show you what those consist of. So basically you have a trace that has to be cut here. And then you have to run a wire from this via right here. So you got to scrape away solder mask, run a little wire from this via around, and then um, attach it to ground, which is on this leg here, or any other ground point really. And then you have to run a wire from this pad that you cut the trace for around to this pad right here. And that basically reroutes some of the some of the um, address lines and pulls the appropriate things that need to be pulled high or low to the appropriate um, setting, essentially, to make the multi-cart uh, Mega Man X4 aspect of it function properly. Because this chip... This adapter was not really meant for this purpose, but it can be adapted to work this way. So that's a little bit of a kind of a hacky solution to getting this done. As you can see here, this was in one of my multi-carts and it's missing a pad. There's supposed to be a third pad right here. 
but that pad uh, ripped off while I was working on this uh, cartridge. So uh, essentially this is a useless, I mean, it, it could be, you could bodge a wire in here, but uh, this is not nearly as useful uh, as it would have otherwise been. Um, also, RetroStage is out of stock on these and they don't expect to have any back in stock until March, uh, which is a while to wait if you're trying to do these kinds of projects. Um, the files for this chip or for this adapter are available on GitHub. So they were released uh, publicly for anybody to use to, to make copies of it. So you don't have to buy them from Retro Stage if you don't want to. Um, you can send them out to a board house yourself and get them made. Um, but what I'm going to show you today is one is a board that I made. And this is based off of the Retro Stage adapter. It's actually uh, uses the schematic uh, and the board layout from the retro stage adapter. Um, it just makes a few critical modifications. Uh, basically, instead of having to cut this trace here, I added a three, uh, well, a two-way jumper. So you can either set it uh, on the right side, you can set the jumper to the right, to the MSU side, and that will allow you to use it as a normal Super FX adapter. And if you set this jumper to the CX4 side on the left, then that allows you to use it as a CX4 chip. Um, yeah, so basically that's how that works. And then down here, there's another jumper uh, that you only close if you're doing a CX4 cartridge, and that will um, set everything correctly without having to run any wires. So this chip, I actually have the uh, listing, the link to the Oshpark uh, upload where uh, you can actually go and purchase this chip. It's about I think it's about three dollars, maybe three dollars and fifty cents to order a three pack of these from Arsh Park. So it's a good value. And if you're going to be doing CX4 multi carts, this is perfect for that. Uh, you can still use it for Super FX cartridges because otherwise it is functionally the same as the Retro Stage adapter. But you do have to set this jumper here, um, and it may. I haven't checked this yet, but this jumper is probably going to interfere with uh, 29F016 chips because they have a wider profile. So they may over overlap on top of this jumper and you will need to set this jumper. So it may not work for some uh, types of modifications um, that use 29F016s. But um, this board right here is actually the V1 version of this board and it does have an error in the routing of the traces for this jumper here. So this isn't going to be, we're not going to use this jumper, we're, we are going to make a little modification uh, to this board, but that does not apply to the V2 board which is what is on Osh Park now. So if you order this you won't have to do one of the things that we're going to do, so I'll point that out later. So uh, essentially all we need to do is get a chip programmed up to uh, contain the combined ROMs for Mega Man X1 and, or X2 and 3. Um, and then we'll be running a little switch. Um, there's a few different ways you can do switching for these. Um, basically what I'm going to do is run a little switch to the side of the cartridge. That's what I've done in the past. Here's, a, here's one of my Mega Man X2 uh, and 3 multi-carts here. So uh, you can run a switch to the side of the cartridge that you can flip up or down to select which game you're in. And that's what we'll be doing again today. There is a way to do a binary counter um, that works based off of the reset button. So you can plug it into the into the NES or into the Super Nintendo, turn it on, uh, and then every time you hit the reset button, it changes the game. Uh, that's a nice way to do it without having any external uh, indicator that it is a multi-cart. Uh, you don't do any damage to the original card or anything like that. So that's an option for you if you're looking to do a multi-cart that doesn't have any uh, external like modification done. But I don't have uh, any of the components to do that type of mod right now. I'm actually planning on integrating the reset mod into a, a future version of this board that's more directly tailored to the CX4 board. So eventually you'll probably see that on here as well. Okay, so to get started, we'll go ahead and program this board. So let me get everything situated over here on the computer. Okay. Got 
gotta go find the ROM. <coughs> and now that I'm thinking about it, I actually don't know where the ROM is. <laughs> I would assume it's in my Super Nintendo ROMs folder, but um, I made this ROM a long time ago. Uh, let's see here. I haven't done one of these multi cards in a while, so this may take a second to find. Burning cartridge. Super Boss Gaiden. That's a that's a fun one. Uh, let's see. Ah, there it is. Okay. <clears throat> ah, yes. As I recall, you can't drag and drop with the Mini Pro Programmer. What a shame. So we're going to have to open it up the old-fashioned way. <clears throat> There it is. Okay, so this is uh, basically just a ROM file that contains both Mega Man X uh, 2 and 3 in its entirety, just stacked one on top of the other. So that way you have both games and they're stored, one game is stored in the lower uh, 8 megabits, or sorry, the lower 16 megabits of the chip and then the other is stored in the uh, the upper uh, 16 megabits of the chip um, yeah that's pretty much how that works so the switch we're going to be installing simply switches it from the upper or lower 16 megabits of the chip and that switches which game is being read so we're going to go ahead and program this one And while that's happening, let me go grab the switches. And one thing we are going to do here is use some of the dreaded hot glue. I hate to say it, but it's the best way that I have at this point for installing the switch. Um, I would like to, another project I'd like to do, it, well, I mean, ultimately the reset based uh, ROM switching would probably be the ideal, but um, I wouldn't mind having an option to have like an extended version of this board that sticks out a little bit further and has a switch, a place to mount a switch that lines up right against the cart edge so this is installed in the in the you know have this installed right here and then have it extend a little bit further out so that it goes to the edge of the cartridge and then you just cut a, a slot for the switch and it would just all line up that would be pretty nice but um, I haven't done any of that yet and if I come up if I get the reset switch integrated in there there really won't be any reason to do that so um you know whatever <laughs> i guess um okay let's go ahead and while that's programming let's get the old mask roms removed from this so there's two mask roms on the uh, cx4 board and we're going to remove both of them
Okay. Oh no! Okay, so that's all done. So the retro stage adapter, or you know, in this case, my adapter, is going to go in the same spot as the uh, number one mask ROM. So let's go ahead and clean up that area there. Our chips done programming. Okay, so we'll get that out of the way. Um, so the U1 mask ROM here is the one that we're going to actually be installing the retro stage board. I keep calling it the retro stage board, it's my board, <laughs> but it's based on the retro stage board, so I can't really take credit. Um, okay, so one thing that you'll notice on this, um, and this is another reason that the CX4 needs a board more tailored to it is that this little capacitor is in the way. It's not really a problem because that capacitor is not actually used for anything important. I mean, it, it is important. I mean, it's there from the factory for a reason. But mostly that reason is just that um, it's just a little bit of extra filtering before the chip gets power. So what we're gonna do is we're actually going to sweep this capacitor off of the board. And um, we're going to move it to a different location. So we're going to still have the capacitor. We're just not going to have it in this particular spot. this area as flat as possible so that the board can sit flush and we'll give it a little clean too okay Okay, so here's what we're going to do for that capacitor. We're actually going to attach that capacitor to another spot um, right up here. So we're going to scrape away a little bit of solder mask so that we can attach that capacitor to this spot right above this first pad where that power comes in.
Okay. Let's add a little solder there. And we're kind of just scraping that solder as we go over it just to make sure that we clear out as much of that mask as possible. Now I'm actually going to clean that off at this point and now we have a pad. Where there once was not, there is now a pad. <laughs> so let's go ahead and attach the adapter board. Once we get the pins aligned, we're first going to just tack it down on the corners. So we've got it down on one corner. I'm gonna get this other corner. Okay, so those corners are tacked down now. So we'll move to the other side and get that tacked down. And actually, it's a little bit too, not enough space up the top. So we're gonna move this side down a little bit and this is why we only tack a couple of spots before we actually go through and actually and solder the whole thing because we don't want to get in a situation where we've kind of used up our our uh, we've kind of like solidified this this board in in one spot and then can't really adjust it later because we do need to be able to adjust it at least initially until we get the fit just right so now what I'm going to do is just kind of scrape through here with a little bit of that solder. And this is, of course, just like with any time you're doing this kind of drag soldering or these castellated pads or anything like that, a lot of times you're going to have bridges, and that's fine because we're going to come back in with lots of flux, and we're going to make sure that it's all clean. The main thing is that you just want to get enough solder flowed in there and you want to get enough heat in those joints to ensure that you have a good connection um, because that's really all that matters. You can you can fix bridges later but you know a poor connection is just going to be a problem no matter what. Let's go ahead and get some flux applied. Okay. Okay. So we're bridge free on this side. This side is just a nightmare. <laughs> Side's done too. So now let's go ahead and add this capacitor back in.
Didn't exactly cooperate. There we go. There we go. It's in. So, now you can see, maybe, there are no bridges. We're all nice and connected. Okay. Let's go ahead and add our program chip. Get it lined up just right. Okay. So the important thing here is of course just that we get a good connection on one corner as always. Okay, and there we go. So we got a nice tack down corner. Now we're gonna move to the other side here and we're gonna get this lined up properly. These chips rarely ever wanna align properly without some persuasion. That's why, again, you don't want to solder one whole side before you've confirmed the alignment on the other side. Because that'll just be a bad day for you. Okay, got that side tacked. Let's go ahead and uh, finish soldering this side by adding some flux. And we'll go through and drag this solder. Flux to that, it's not cooperating there. Let's try this side. Okay. Remove the excess. Remove more excess. Okay, that should be. That should be it. Got to add more flux. We ran out of flux. Just got one little bridge to clear here. And there it is. So that side's clear. Let's finish up this side.
There's no such thing as too much flux. However, I am running out. Ken Lewis Rossman is out of stock. I'm trying to conserve my flux while Lewis is out of stock. Because I don't know what I'm going to do if I run out. I had to buy some rosin. Well, I actually have some rosin flux. I might have to start using rosin flux, which would be a real nightmare. It's been a long time since I used rosin flux. And uh, I'd like to not go back to that lifestyle. Th those were dark times. Dark, dark times indeed. Suppose I could get some no, fl uh, like some no clean, like some Kester no clean flux or something like that. But I just, I do not like no clean flux. Not one bit. I don't think it does a good job of fluxing. <laughs> it evaporates so quickly. Doesn't require much heat to to kind of get rid of all of it. So I don't think it's very effective for this kind of work. And you see, there's a lot of like drag soldering and stuff like that. There's there's a lot of of time and, and work that goes in there. You get these large areas with large, um, you know, like ground planes and stuff that sink a lot of heat. It takes some time to solder those areas. And if your uh, flux can't, uh, you know, can't hack it evaporates so quickly you know you might be in trouble just double checking everything under the microscope okay no bridges everything looks good so now we're gonna set the jumpers and like I said, there is an issue with one of these jumpers. There's an error in this version of the board. So we're going to be doing things a little bit differently here. We're going to set the top jumper. We're going to set that to CX4. So that is correct and working on this board. So that jumper is set to CX4. The MSU pad is just loose there. So now down on this CX4 pad here, that's going to be a little bit different. So we need to set that low. And the issue is that, um, see this side here, this side here of the pad is correct. That's the actual that's actually going to the pin that we need to set high or low. Um, well, that we need to set low, but for some reason I made a mistake when making the modification to this board and I configured this pad here to go high. So what we need to do is instead run this uh, pad on the right here to a ground point. The easiest and quickest ground point is this pad right up here. That's a ground point. So we're going to run a little wire from this pad to this pad, and that's going to solve the issue. And we're going to leave this pad open. We're actually going to use that for another part of this modification later um, for the selector switch to set the uh, banks lo low or high. Um, we'll get there, though. So right now we're going to set this jumper by taking a little bit of wire you're just gonna strip off quite a bit of wire here and basically all we're gonna do with this wire is we're just gonna tack it down Initially, to this first pad, we're just going to tack it down right here. So it's making a connection with that pad. We're just going to oop. See, this is this is, you know, you gotta you gotta be careful with this stuff. Okay, so we're just going to bend this over here. Okay, we're just going to use our tweezers to 
bend this little wire around and get it positioned with that pad right there. So now we'll just solder that. Just lightly tack this in place. Okay, so that's tacked in place now. And we're just gonna snip the excess off of there with our cutters. And then we're gonna hit that with a little bit of flux both points we're going to hit with a little bit of flux and we're go, going to go back there and re-wet that joint to just ensure a quality connection to both of those pads. Okay, so that's good. Now for selecting which ROM we have, we're actually gonna use this pad, this pad right here in the middle of the top grouping of pads is the address line that will allow us to select which ROM we're on. So let's go ahead and add some solder right there. So if you pull this pin low, it's going to select Mega Man X2. If you pull it high, it's going to select Mega Man X3. That's how the banks are set up in this, in this chip. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our little, our little switch here. we got a switch that's a, it's a single throw, double pole switch. And it just switches between, um, you know, uh, the center pin switches between the two outer pins. So we're going to want run the center pin wire to this pad here, and then we're going to sit, run the other two to ground and VCC source on the board, and that's going to provide the switching that we need um, to be able to switch between two different games. So let's just cut ourselves a little three wire, a little bit of ribbon. So we're going to have a little bit of ribbon here, three wire ribbon. We're just going to strip it and tin it. Let's go ahead and tin the, the uh, legs on this switch here.
Okay, so the switch is wired. So now we're gonna wire the other three leads here to the points on the board that we need to. Okay, so like I said, the middle wire the middle wire is going to this pad right here. So we're going to go ahead and solder that in. Then we're going to take another wire and we're going to solder it to this. This is also a ground pad right here. So we're going to take one of the outer wires and solder it right here to this ground pad. Okay, so that's done. And then we're going to take this last wire and we're going to solder it right here where this capacitor is hooked up. This is a uh, this is a uh, VCC line. So we're just going to attach it right there to the edge of that capacitor right on those pins and that pulls it to that pulls it high. So now that this switch is installed We can actually switch which game it's on. <clears throat> now we're going to cut a little slot um, in the casing for that. But first, we're going to pop this into the Super Nintendo and we're going to test it so I can show you that it works. <clears throat> I was having some issues with the audio in the game ca capture portion of the uh, stream setup, uh, and I'm hoping that that's fixed now, but I don't know for sure. So if it's not, I apologize. Get us a Super Nintendo over here. So we're gonna pop the cartridge in to the Super Nintendo and we're gonna set the we're gonna set it to Mega Man X2 and power it on. Mm, hold on a second. Oh, we're having capture card issues, Na <laughs> naturally. Hold on. There we go. All right, let's try again. <clears throat> okay, so there you go, Mega Man X2. Now, um, 
Let's see here. Where's the Super Nintendo controller? So there you go, there's Mega Man X2. Now let's go ahead and switch the cartridge to Mega Man X3. Capcom 95. There you go, so Mega Man X3. So that's how you do it. Now as far as the casing, what I've done is I've gone ahead and got the lines marked on a casing that we're gonna uh, be modifying. So I scored in, I don't know if you can see that, but yeah, so I scored the lines a little bit there. Um, so that I could easily cut this out. I'm gonna use a hobby knife to just trim away at this until I have cut out a switch area. So I'll go ahead and get to work on that. Okay. So I'm pretty happy with that slot. It looks pretty good. Just clean it up a little bit more. The nice thing is that you can just do all of this with a with a hobby knife. You don't even really need to file anything. I like to do a little bit of a chamfer on the edge to make it a little bit easier to get down there to the switch just with a fingernail or something like that. So there you go. So that's kind of what the, the switch is going to look like there. We also had to modify the top case just a little bit too so that the switch can just sit flush and uh, basically the inner plastic here needs to be cut out to make room for it as well and I've already scored that too. So that's cut out too. So now 
you have a nice clean hole there for the switch. We also need to trim inside of the casing a little bit here. Just trim away a little bit of the wall to make uh, to allow the switch to set as far forward as possible. Because if you want this to be accessible by like a, a fingernail or something, you need that to be sitting a little bit further forward. It's just a little too far in uh, to easily get at it. Um, so I always trim a little bit of the inner casing as well to make room for uh, you know nails and stuff like that. You don't have to, but it certain it, it definitely makes it easier to use. Okay, so the top case is cut back a little bit. So now you see it is, you may not be able to see that due to focus, but it's almost completely flush. <clears throat> we need to do the same thing to the bottom case. That ought to do it for that too. Let's just check how the switch sits. Looks pretty good. <clears throat> so, when everything is together, basically, the switch will sit right about here. Like that. So we need to get it positioned so that some hot glue can be applied to hold it in place. And I know hot glue is evil and it's probably pretty offensive to everyone that I'm even using it, but it really is just totally perfect for this application. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not a big fan of it, but it works really well here. I can't deny that. So, <clears throat> I got the glue gun heated up over here. You're not gonna see this because uh, the glue gun's nowhere near the camera. But, uh, so, I apologize. But, um, I get one bead of glue in there to kinda hold it in place.
And while that cools, we're just going to try to make sure that it has space. Because the switch has space to be able to be actuated. Um, and then, once this first bead of glue is cooled, then we're going to go ham. We're just going to cram that glue in there just to make sure the switch is mechanically strong enough to be able to be switched uh, repeatedly without issue. I'm going to clean up those hot glue whiskers too. So I think that is <clears throat> more or less dry at this point. Well, turns out it is less dry than more. But it does hold, it does stay together on its own now. So let's go ahead and add the rest of the hot glue. That ought to do it. And you kind of got to make sure the switch stays where it's supposed to be because it tries to move around on you. So just keep it in place. as much as we can without burning ourselves. Well, burning ourselves as little as possible. I guess I'll say. Okay, that looks good there. So we're just gonna let this cool. And we may add another little squirt of hot glue in there, depending on how this, uh, how sturdy this is once it's dry. But uh, that's pretty much it. Once you're done with the hot glue and it's all set and everything, you can pretty much just reassemble the cartridge, and um, that should about do it. So, just gotta babysit this. It's kind of boring. Gotta babysit it while it cools down so it doesn't go crazy on you. Because it will try. Okay, I think it's pretty much set at this point. Thankfully. This is the biggest pain of the whole process, so if I can come up with a better way to make this not suck, <laughs> I will uh, gladly do that. So anyway, in the future, if you need to take this board apart, basically you've got a little bit of slack there on the switch wire, so you can desolder the switch wire if you need to do work to the board. But pretty much other than that, that's all there is to it just stays together like that. So we'll go ahead and put the top case back on. And there you go. You have a switchable cartridge. And it's, oh, it's so hard. Oh, it's so difficult to get in there and switch it. Ooh, okay. Well, let's go ahead and add a little bit of a chamfer on the top case as well.
Oh, it's still so difficult. It's just so deep in there. <laughs> well, that was not as good as the other one. You can switch it, but you need to have some pretty serious nails to get into this one. So I may have to rework this one a little bit and, and cut more of that housing out. I thought I had cut out enough, but apparently not. This one here, you can just, it's just right there. You can switch it with your finger, no problem. Well, anyway, so lesson learned. Got to set that switch as far forward as you can. But this is a functional cartridge. It's ready to go. Um, I'll probably readjust that switch some more off stream, but you don't need to see that because, frankly, it's not a big deal. So we'll go ahead and put this back together. Pop it back in the Super Nintendo one more time to show it in its final form. There you go. Mega Man X3. Man X2. And that is how you make a CX4 multi cart. Uh, well, that's pretty much all there is to it. If you check out the uh, down in the description, I have the uh, link to the adapter board that I used here, the updated version that doesn't require the extra little wire to be run. And um, you, can, uh, you can build this yourself as well. All you need is a Rockman X2 cartridge. Um, it's a little bit different with X3, so I would personally just not not mess with X3. I think X3 cartridges are more expensive anyway, so it's really probably not worthwhile. Uh, but anyway, I hope you enjoyed it. Um, if you did, please come back next time. Uh, we'll see you then.